Exactly, exactly. Um, so, um, so, so what we're going to kick on? Well, we know exactly what we're going to be doing, but uh, how is this going to be introduced? Um, this is coming up next. Now we have Amanda and Emma Kelly, which was pre-recorded midnight last night. Uh, unfortunately, like. Uh, this is just the way it, it's it's been working with European News Weekly. We've been doing a lot of pre-records, and we're, we're we're trying to get the information out as best we can. And unfortunately, it can't always be live. But this is a fascinating uh, chat, like with uh, Emma and Amanda concerning their uh, brother, John Kelly, who died under mysterious circumstances. Uh, what year was it, John? Was it two thousand and nine? Seven seven years ago. So it was uh, it was uh, roughly about two thousand seven, I would imagine. Two thousand seven. Okay, okay. Um, so listen, will I go ahead and we we'll play this uh, before we, we we waste too much time in babbling? Indeed, I think we should just uh, just just play this. It's uh, stunning. I'm going to uh, sit back and, uh, and and listen to it again. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome to European News Weekly. Uh, we've got our Irish section here this week. Uh, we're basically uh, coming into uh, uh, an interview now with uh, Emma and Amanda Kelly, uh, who are the uh, sisters of John Kelly, who was uh, murdered uh, and uh, the uh, campaign has started to take underway to find some justice for him. Um, so uh, just before we come to that, uh, we might mention that uh, on the 7th of July, uh, while there was a protest outside uh, on behalf of John Kelly and others, uh, that uh, on Tuesday the 7th of July 2015 in the leaders' questions in the Dáil, which is the Irish Parliament, uh, we had uh, Claire Daly making some statements and I just want to go through those very quickly. Uh, um, so Claire Daly said to the Minister, the Minister has not dealt with how many of the cases have been concluded. Subsequent to the questions being tabled, well, some of the people who made complaints have begun to get replies, and to say they received is beyond their worst expectations is probably an understatement. The letters I have seen from the panel represent a re-abuse of people badly let down by the system. I'm speaking about the cases of unexplained deaths which family members believe to be murder, as in the case of James Goonan, where the reply of the panel to the family was that it was very sorry for the family's loss but the family problem seemed to be that the Garda uh, did not investigate the murder properly. The panel concluded that it should, would not ask the Garda to reinvestigate it, which would have been bad enough, but ask the Commissioner for a report. That was the outcome of a year's deliberation in the case of a horrific death of an elderly gentleman. A woman spoke to me this morning about sexual abuse allegations involving her two children, which were not investigated. The answer she received was that the case went to the DPP, that was it. The whole point behind this was that the women, uh, sorry, that the people had problems with the investigative process, be it that the DPP or Garda, and to get an answer, su um, answer such as this exposes the entire system. Then there was a reply from Deputy Fran Francis Fitzgerald, which I shall skip by, uh, and then finally uh, Deputy Claire Daly said, the minister should be in a position to do so. I would like her to re-examine the figures and statistics she gave. It is precisely out of the respect for the complainants that I raise these queries. People such as the family of John Kelly are outside in the lashing of rain because of their brother's death has never been explained. We put out a call last time we had question time to ask many of the hundreds of people who submitted those complaints whether any of them had been asked for extra information or had, uh, had any of these resubmitted extra information uh, and been examined on it. People came back and all, all said, not in their case. We are aware of many cases like the Tahui family where evidence came to light and the panel patiently refused to look at it. I do not believe it. The process carried out any serious examination. This side of the House raised concerns that it was an attempt to divert attention from the growing anger among some of the families for justice. Of the replies we have seen so far there has not been one and the Minister did not answer how many of the cases have been concluded because none of the conclusions we have seen, and we have begun to see many, would accept the viewpoint the Minister has put forward. So with that, um, that was just recently in the Dal, and uh, once again Claire Daly, TD, uh, voicing uh, sort of opinions um, and issues 
that are coming up in, uh, in social society. Um, so obviously coming over now to Emma and Amanda, uh, we'd like to first ask Emma, um, could you sort of uh, explain to, to us, uh, you know, sort of where you are from, and where this uh, situation was uh, seen, and uh, you know, sort of what the uh, time frame was, um, and uh, just uh, any details uh, regarding the incident generally, if you could please, Emma. Yeah, um, well basically we're from Tallinn and um, my brother John, he's 24, he was on his way home from a Thai county from there, travelling up to Dublin because he had work the next day with his brother-in-law. And um, <clears throat> basically John was taken out of the canal in Dublin Docklands. So when my family were contacted by the Gardaí, we were told there was one phone call made that night. So since then, you know, um, my family have went out to Dublin Docklands and interviewed residents because, number one, he's 24 years of age, healthy young guy, had everything ahead of him, he was going to Australia. Why is he in a canal, you know? So we just didn't accept. The, the Gardaí were saying that there was nothing suspicious about his death. Well, there was. There was. We just didn't believe that. So we went around and interviewed the residents who actually heard John crying that night. And all of them were out on their balcony screaming to him, saying, you know, hang on, the guards are coming. There were several calls that night, not just one phone call. So. We kept saying to guys, this isn't right, this is not right, there's something wrong. Um, John's belongings were gone. He had no phone, bracelet, money. He had money that day. He bought a brand new pair of runners, which we can, we, we, myself and my family actually have CC footage of that. We went around looking for it. And, um, you know, so the guys wouldn't have, they didn't investigate his death. Like, to be honest, it was a cover-up from the start. Um, <clears throat> any evidence that we did get, we forwarded on to them saying, you know, can you look into this, do that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 they didn't bother. So um, we, we hired a private investigator, Billy Flynn. Now he's, he actually uncovered the corruption up in the north, the McBerty family. <coughs> um, so, yeah. Obviously, Billy was on the case then, and whatever he got, he sent into the guards. I'm sure that was a waste of time, you know. He obviously didn't forward it, follow it up. So, Billy unfortunately passed away, so therefore the whole investigation was on hold for a few years. And here we are now today. <laughs> um, our case is in with the panel review. Um, I don't know. We're not holding up much hope for it, to be honest. Like it's it's in there nine months now, and we've emailed the minister several times, and it's the same stuff we're getting back. You know, it takes time, blah blah blah. It's 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 paper review, and um, they've never contacted us and asked us, you know, what's your side? What evidence do you have? Um, what else? the um. Yeah, they're, 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 sorry, they're actually, sorry, I'm just, they, um, they're reviewing papers from the actual Gardaí. Well, they never actually investigated John's death, so what is there to review, you know? Right, so there's no investigation initially then, basically. So there's, no. So you're saying there's no data for the, the, the court to look at. Yeah, so what are they reviewing, you know? No, absolutely, and there's no... Uh, yeah. And, and uh, I suppose we should ask, uh, you know, obviously for the for the record, you haven't been asked for any statements by GSOC, uh, either of you, have? No, 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 right. no none at all. Now I did email GSOC and ask them, has the review mechanism contacted them? Because we did lodge complaints in 2009, which is a 13 page complaint where you'd have a lot more details in it. And um, apparently the review mechanism is not entitled to request or receive any such in information from GSOC. So I don't know where the minister's going with that one. So there's a serious lack of transparency then in this yeah. process? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, she's saying one thing but they're saying another. So, you know, 
Paris is an independent review and nobody seems to know what's what, you know? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's definitely a, an issue there. So, um, and, and are you getting much in the way of legal support uh, along the way with solicitors or, or uh, pro bono, any pro bono uh, solicitors helping you? Hi, it's, it's Amanda here. Um, no, we, we, we haven't gone down that road. I mean, at the end of the day, all we've ever just wanted was for John's death to be investigated, and that's our aim. We want the case to be opened and, re and, and investigated so that we can get justice. I mean, there are so many things that are, that are wrong. John was murdered, and it is so, so clear that he was. Um, but because of, of the, the, I don't know, the inadequacies on the night, um, there was a cover-up. So to, to go down the legal route is just not what we're for, um, but we're just campaigning now to get this case opened because it's not just our family, it's so many other families um, that are suffering in the way we have and um, it's just it's not acceptable it's just not acceptable and we will not go away and they need to know that well, well said Amanda well said um, so what, what was what's kind of been the impact on on the uh, the family the wider family and, and friends indeed you know of John and uh, uh, can you sort of give us a, a little bit of a breakdown of that either one of you or yeah, you know, the impact is huge. We're seven years on and there's there's no grieving. You cannot grieve. Um, there's no putting John to rest and, you know, when you've got no answers, it's it's a constant battle. I mean, daily, you, you're constantly going over how he died, why he died, why wasn't he given justice, you know, why have why have we been treated this way? The manner in what we've been treated is absolutely appalling. And again, with this paper review, it's just another insult to all the victims out there. It's, it's an absolute disgrace what is going on in our country. And, you know, um, it's, it's like disrespecting victims and families all over again. And it's just not good enough. The impact is just so huge. It's... Uh, Honestly, it, it is, it's, it's just terrible to, to have to go through what we're going through in your head alone is just unbelievable. Uh, what, what's been the impact on your parents, uh, do you mind me asking? Um, my parents, to be quite honest, my, my father had a stroke um, after John's first inquest. We had two inquests. He had a stroke after the first inquest. His health has been extremely bad. My mother is... Um, my, my, my mother doesn't even leave the house and um, she suffers terrible with anxiety she, um, she I mean even going to protest she can't bring herself because she can't hold herself up it's it's been a huge impact um, we're all trying to do our, our bit in the family and what we say to each other is I mean myself and Emma do the paperwork the girls do the campaign um, and when it gets all too much we have to say right okay we need to take a break because it, re it, it affects your mental state and your health um, and yeah and, the, and there's our parents you know I guess what they go through is they're supposed to outlive the child you know so a, that's a definitely a hard one for a parent oh. to take on I understand that yeah yeah so it's yes. uh, and your mother's stress did that that begin after the the incident or was, was that was that something that she had, or...? For a no, it, it, that whole thing, it's, it began after, I mean, uh -huh. the, first, for, the first year of the investigation, when, when John's body was taken from the canal initially, it was a week before we buried him. Um, two to three days after we buried John, we actually, because we're dealing with the police at this stage, and from the word go, they said, there's nothing suspicious about this death and therefore we will not be investigating and, and we were just going well that's not good enough so two to three days after we buried John um, we we actually went into the city centre and we retraced his footsteps and going into buildings and getting CCTV footage um, and we, we started it straight away um, my mother actually seen John in the coffin we were we were told that it should be um, a, a closed coffin because the night that he actually died 
they, they couldn't find his body. They didn't recover his body until the next day. So they said that, you know, John's body was damaged, so it was best not to see him. But she asked for the coffin to be open so she could say goodbye. Um, so to be told that there's not a mark on your child and then the coffin is open and to see bruising on his body and his hands clenched and scraped, um, you know, that's, that stays with you. So the impact for that for my mother has just been huge. Oh, Lordy, that sounds terrible. So sorry yeah. to hear it. Um, right, so I suppose you, you, you would, well, you sort of answered this really, but, but you know, uh, evidence of wrongdoing. You're saying you, you've got uh, plenty of evidence that was dug up by yourselves and the family and by the, uh, the uh, private investigator that you, you employed. Uh, yeah. So it, it, with this paper trial, I, I'm just, just out of interest, I know, I know it's very early in your campaign. Uh, have you have you looked into the options of the European Court of Human Rights um, at all? Yes, yes, we have, we have. We're we're not getting anywhere in Ireland, and um, you know, from the start there was the, the whole thing about the case. I mean, from the start, not only they wouldn't investigate it, but then what what they did then was go around to residents in the apartments and actually say that it, it was a suicide. You couldn't help this lad anyway, even though he was crying out for help for over an hour. Um, there was so many calls that night, and yet they say to us there's only one call, um, and then we discover there's many, many other calls. So from the start, this has been a shambles, and absolutely, we're not getting answers in Ireland, and if we do not get answers in Ireland, we, we will move forward with this. Um, regarding our campaign, obviously we've, we've set up um, a Facebook page for John. We've also set up um, a, peti a petition um, to... to to get the Minister for Justice to investigate John's case, so that's change.org. Um, we've also set up Twitter, so that's that's very new. So that's that's something that we're learning, and um, and anything that we can do, we will do, and not just for our family, for for all the other victims and families out there. You know, we're lucky that that there's a group of us, there's a group of family members doing this together. To do this on your own, I, I just don't know how anyone would have the strength to do it on their own. Because physically and mentally, as I said already, it's absolutely, it, it's shocking what this type of thing can actually do to you. So we're not just for, for justice for John, we're justice for everyone. You know, the more people that stand together, the stronger we get. And... Again, we're not going away, and they need to know that. Right. So, concerning sort of uh, media coverage, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to give us a, a little bit of uh, a sort of a backdrop on, on how you've been received by the, uh, the sort of the mainstream media, newspapers, and TV channels, and what have? You? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to say that our local paper, the Tala Echo, have been brilliant from the start. Um, they, they really have. They've supported us in every way. They've told the story as it has been. Um, no lies in there. Um, regarding other papers, at the start, um, we, we contacted every paper we could think of, and, and papers contacted us because we, we actually went and we put posters, the information posters, all over the city centre. So there was some people that actually seen that and contacted us. When we told the story, um, they were extremely interested. But when we mentioned um, that the police could have actually, they could have save John on the night and that rescue services weren't actually rang until he was dead and um, never at any stage through any of those phone calls where where water rescue services actually rang what they thought they were going to do on foot I just don't know um, but once we mentioned that to, to papers it, it it was kind of they didn't really want to know so they would take the story they tell us the story was going to be in the paper on this day and never arrived and then when it did arrive, it was a tiny little piece which was absolute rubbish and not what had happened. So we feel that we've been blocked by the media um, in, in every step of the way. Um, obviously, we did go on prime time um, 2009, and that was four months after John's death. And it was true a contact that, that Billy Flynn actually had. And I do believe that if we, if we hadn't had Billy on our case, we would have never even got prime time because... Nobody wanted to know. They just didn't want to deal with it. Well, he did a good job there, then, obviously. So. Absolutely. 
Um, Jimmy, can I can I can I throw this over to you? I, I'm sure you've been taking notes. Is there is there anything you've picked up on or? Well, I, I think it's it's quite a shocking case, really. Like I'm here with my my mouth open, and uh, to hear that like uh, people were shouting, because uh, obviously like you were in touch with the local residents there by the canal, and you, you you've obviously like been chatting with very many of them, and, and loads of people said that John was shouting for over an hour, and uh, it seems to me like. The police could have been uh, getting answers uh, to, uh, like that, like going around doing interviews, and so obviously they haven't done anything. And uh, you got um, really badly let down also by the uh, by the ombudsman, the police ombudsman. So you eventually ended up like, how did you end up finding Stephen Manning and uh, Integrity Ireland? And would you like to be able to give us a little bit of background into um, what prompted you to contact an NGO? Um, well, we, we really didn't, to be honest. Um, we, we only know Integrity Ireland through our, through our Facebook campaign, so we don't really know a, a huge... I mean, I guess we know what they stand for, but regarding, do, you know, having any contact uh, regarding the cases and that, we don't. OK, OK. Um, so, I guess... So, because Stephen is doing great work at the minute, like, and he's been... In general, he's been um, finding issues like this. He's got quite a database of people who have been let down badly by, uh, by the by the by the guardie. They've been let down badly by the public authorities. So, um, I guess it it might be a good idea. Um, it might be another option, perhaps, to 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 um, to stay in contact with Stephen, perhaps. And uh, there's a there's a, a good group of people there uh, working together to to try and get justice in these matters. So it might be a, another avenue of that you could uh, use to to generate support and to uh, and and to get involved with people who are in a similar situation. Absolutely, and you know, look, we're we're in touch with so many different groups, and again, we're all trying to do the same thing as is. Integrity Ireland, you know, we're all trying to get justice here, um, and so that's it, like the more people you contact, the better, and it's, it's just about getting it out there. Um, uh, just out of interest, have you uh, contacted Min Ming Flanagan about any sort of European strategies for, for getting your case heard? No, not yet, not yet. Um, again, you know, we were hoping with this paper review that we, we would get some, well, where we hope and maybe not but you know we, we really did think that they would have to do something i mean at the end of the day um John, john's case they, it just is what it is you know they can't be seen not to do anything about it so um again we will be taking further steps um, and we're, we're just at the process now of saying okay well where do we need to go to move forward because as we said we've emailed the minister several times um, about John's case, and we're, we're having no response, so maybe that is our next step. Okay, well, um, I, I've got, got a last question for you both, actually, and, uh, you know, obviously you can answer it in any depth you wish to, uh, but from my point of view, and I think for maybe the, the listeners, they'd probably like to know what kind of emotional um, sort of impact uh, this has had on you personally, and maybe I could go to Amanda first, uh, and just ask... Um, how did, how did it affect you, Amanda, uh, over the last seven years? And uh, you know, obviously, you've you've uh, steeled yourself for this campaign. And but but what were some of the background uh, emotional things that you dealt with you personally yourself? Oh God, where where do you start? Um, you know, the whole emotional thing. It, what this actually does to you? I've I've suffered with panic attacks. Um, not sleeping at night time, constantly getting sick. Um, the emotions are so strong, it, I just can't explain what it does to you. And in a sense, what has to happen is your body shuts down from, from any sort of feeling because to, to actually think about what's happened and how they disrespected, not us, but how they disrespected John, what they have done is so appalling. If if you actually sit with that feeling, you wouldn't be able to do a campaign and move forward. So I guess, I guess that end of things is we just want this over. We want to grieve. Um, you know, we just want to grieve. 
we want to move on in our lives and there is no moving on. There is no moving on. We're seven years down the line and we're still telling the same story and we're still reliving it over and over and that hurts. It hurts like hell. <laughs> Right, right. And I, I suppose I should come to you, Emma, and, and ask that same question to you, and, uh, if, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Well, it's kind of the same answer, you know. Ah. It's, it's devastating. You do. You go through so many different things, and one minute you're upset, then you're angry, you're frustrated. You just, like, you just don't know what to feel or how to feel, and then you do have to shut down. Obviously, your body just shuts down to protect you from that craziness and it's it's just it's inhumane like it's just not right you know sounds very much like a kind of shock or post traumatic traumatic stress or maybe a situational oh, yeah. depression and mixture of all the above maybe huh yeah yeah definitely yeah true yeah your but body does go into shock to shut down and so you don't feel it you know so sure <laughs> But it's it's a driver, I suppose, for your campaign. Is that, is that a fair comment? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. It's um, it, it definitely is. I have to say, it definitely is. It's, it's it, the anger drives it on. The the injustice of it drives it on. And um, I love for our little brother. Yeah, he didn't deserve it. Nobody would have deserved the debt he got. And it's, it's just disgusting. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, well, uh, it, I, I, from my point, it's been a, an absolute pleasure and, uh, you know, and sadness as well uh, to, to have this interview. Um, you, you're both very strong and wonderful people for, for uh, sort of uh, doing what you need to do, you know, to, to help your family and friends to, as you're saying, put this case uh, part in the past as opposed to it being fresh and raw. Um, we can only wish you uh, the best of luck and maybe uh, sometime in the future for you to come back and give us a, an update and hopefully a positive one. Um, uh, is there anything you'd like to say, Jimmy, uh, at the end here? Well, um, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Amanda and Emma, uh, both of you, for coming on and sharing the story with us. Uh, I do hope that you get some closure in this matter and I think uh, myself and Sean will do our level best to get this information out to a, a, as wide a, a group as possible and, and get as many people to hear the story as possible and I'm sure we can think of other ways of uh, of, of getting this story out and uh, possibly contacting people also so we're behind you anyway and I'm, I'm, again my condolences Brilliant, that's great, well listen thank you both, we're, we're delighted to have the opportunity to get John's story out there and yeah, yeah brilliant, we appreciate any help you can give us Absolutely, and you know, maybe maybe by us uh, telling our story and moving forward, it'll give other people hope and it'll give them strength to actually bring their own cases because you're only, I, I guess you're only hearing a, a number of cases um, that have been brought forward and, and there is other people out there that are maybe too frightened or don't want to go through it again, so maybe it'll bring some sort of hope to them and, um, and, and we will get justice, we will get justice, our day will come. Cut it there, Jim. Well, oh my God, Sean, listen back to that uh, conversation again, and it, it's heart wrenching. I forgot how nervous I was actually uh, when I did that that interview. It was uh, really kind of uh, a powerful uh, situation to be in. It's uh, yeah, it's tough, very very tough. And uh, it's just been a hell of a roller coaster ride this last three hours, and it's all come together in the last two days. It's, it's just uh, uh, an amazing uh, thing to see come together. Yeah, well, I thought we were going to be coming delivering the news this week, and yet uh, we've had no news show. And uh, it's well, uh, yeah, yeah, all um, original content, though, isn't it? You know, this uh, is the thing. So, you'll have to forgive me, Sean. I'm still just a bit gut wrenched over Amanda and Emma's story there. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm sure we're not alone in the uh, in the what in the uh, web verse at the moment with that st after that particular story. That's uh, you know, we'll, we'll have all the links, we'll put it up on the podcast, we'll get it out there on Facebook. Um, I would say just to those out there that are missing the European news uh, stories, uh, if you go to Sean, S-E-A-N, 
Arclight, A-R-C-L-I-G-H-T, uh, on Facebook. And you can read the uh, stories that we would have uh, shown had uh, had not all these uh, uh, sort of uh, urgent uh, sort of interviews occurred. And um, and obviously they've all been with the justice theme. Um, and of course our next guest uh, once again is the justice theme again. Um, and it's the indomitable uh, Stephen Manning, uh, who we've been covering over the last uh, uh, month or two, well, a few months, I think now, uh, Jimmy. Several uh, months. <laughs> Se yeah, wow. Several months. Well, this, this is going back nearly to to when we started broadcasting. We got in I touch with Stephen. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think you're in the time warp there. I, I am, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm just so, finding it yeah. hard to find something humorous to say after after no. listening to Amanda and Emma, it's just, yeah. That was yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, to be honest with you, it's just, what a shame that the, 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 uh, the, the uh, sort of newspapers have to, to let people down by not sharing a story like that, a human interest story. Um, and uh, a very powerful human in, you know, interest story. And in, in the past, we would have had documentaries about this on television before the, uh, the media, the news, was all bought out by the corporations. And we've covered that story uh, on numerous occasions uh, on, on our podcast. So uh, they've certainly let uh, Emma and Amanda down. Um, and, and I suppose and, we've had and, 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 and her mum and dad. And, ah, Look, you know, and it's only just one case, you know. It, well, it's, Taller is a very small town in Dublin. Uh, well, it's quite a large yeah, town, but it used to are, be small. Yeah, it used to be. It small. is a small community, uh, especially in the local areas. Indeed, in yeah. um, And there's some lovely people in those areas, and uh, they're, they're hardworking. Uh, they're, they're bringing their children up. They're doing all the things that they're supposed to do. And it's um, the best of people in Tala, You know, I, I've lived there myself. They're the best of people in Tala. So, you know, it does have a bad reputation, but there's the best people there. Well, there's a big, big area, and there's the good and bad areas. And, Huge, uh, and, and, I, you, and you actually I, have roots in Kushlan, <laughs> <laughs> or Kushlan, 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 Kushlan. <laughs> don't, sh don't shush years, me, you. Don't <laughs> shush me, you. <laughs> um, but, yeah. yeah, it was Kushlan part, but uh, but yeah. that was the rougher area. I've got family also uh, living in some of the what you could consider the posher areas of Tala. Uh, and there are some really lovely communities and very hard-working people uh, in all these areas, including Cushlong Park, I might point out. Indeed, indeed. So listen, are we, we're at 34 minutes. Um, if we don't play uh, our pod with Stephen Manning now, we won't even get to say goodbye to everybody in the chat box. So shall we move on ahead and onwards and upwards? I, I think you're right there. Let's, uh, let's go and hit the... Uh, the amazing testimony of uh, Stephen Manning. Um, uh, uh, Peter Rears back, everyone. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, James Hagen here uh, and Sean McGee with European News Weekly, and we're joined by Stephen Manning. Stephen, welcome to the show yet again. Uh, good to have you back. Oh, thanks, Jimmy, yeah, and uh, hello again, Sean. Good to talk to you again. Welcome to the show, uh, uh, Stephen. Right, so we're going to start off, well, because I know we're against time, so basically, a little update on what's been going on with the uh, with this uh, string of of summonses you've had, like for for um, obviously my understanding is they're, they're traffic violations. Apparently, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's right, Jimmy. Yeah. Um, now, to keep it nice and simple for the listeners, um, uh, I was notified about uh, a month ago that a hearing had been heard in Roscommon District Court and that I had been fined 350 euros and that uh, if I didn't pay it by a certain date in July, a warrant would be issued for my arrest. Uh, now this notice that came to me did not tell me what the hearing was about, what the alleged offence was. It gave me no indicators whatsoever other than a warning that if I didn't pay 350 euros, I was going to be arrested. So of course I wrote to them uh, a detailed letter. First of all, I had to ask them, is this legitimate? Is this actually from you guys? Because with all the weird things that have been going on, and uh, especially on the internet in particular, but we've also had a lot of odd things happening, uh, mail-wise, emails, uh, phone calls, and this sort of stuff. Um, I actually suspected that it was a uh, some sort of a, a vexatious, harassing notice just designed to cause me distress, you know. But uh, they did confirm, oh yes, there was a hearing before Judge uh, Jeffrey Brown, and uh, apparently a policeman, uh, you know, a guard, had... 
um, according to the guard, he'd either stop me for speeding or I was caught speeding on a, on a van. Again, that hasn't been clarified. These are things that have to be sorted out. And then uh, I should have been issued a summons, but I was not issued a summons. Now, that was this first one up in Ross Common Court. Now, I went up there last week and the, talked to the judge, and I've lodged uh, papers now to appeal against this decision, and that's going to be dealt with in due course. Um, I won't spend too much time at that at the moment, but I, I do want to make a couple of clear points about how summonses should be issued and what's going on here. Because, as you now know, last week, um, a, a guard came up in a, in a marked vehicle and came to my door and handed me five more summonses uh, for allegedly going into a bus lane in Dublin. I won't go into the detail of the alleged offence at the moment because the whole thing is absolutely preposterous and ridiculous. I had been trailed by a, a guard in one car. I came, to, I came around a corner and there was another one standing in the road and pointed me to, to pull over. And uh, I was actually on the way to a doll to speak, uh, on, on my way to the doll to speak at a protest. And, uh, you know, the, the circumstances and the coincidences all surrounding this whole thing are just, uh, like I said, they're just too, there are too many to ignore here. But um, the fact is they've issued five summonses, the DPP has issued five summonses, which is forcing me to go up to Dublin now to deal with these next Wednesday. Um, I, I'm in, in discussion with people who know a lot more about this sort of thing than I do to try and uh, guide me as to how best to deal with it. But uh, my urge is to want to just not deal with them at all because I think it's all vexatious and designed to frustrate and cause me difficulties. Uh, and again, another interesting coincidence is that all this has happened just one week before I am due to go in and prosecute a Garda sergeant for assaulting us in Castlebar Courthouse. Um, but anyway, to come back to these summonses, the first question I will be raising is, well, hold on a minute, according to the rules, you're supposed to send summonses by registered post. Now, I'm, I'm, I've got two envelopes here on the counter sitting next to me, uh, one from last year and one uh, from earlier this year. Both are registered post. I know one of them came from our nemesis uh, down in Wexford. Uh, the other one, um, I, I'll have to see if I can find out. There's a prepaid postage stamp on it, so maybe I can find out who actually uh, sent this. But it was an empty envelope. Now, I'm signing for an empty envelope. Now, it won't surprise me at all to find out that this en empty envelope supposedly had summonses in it or something of that nature. Um, but when, you get, when you're up against this level of trickery and deception, by agents of the state, it's almost impossible to know how to deal with it. But anyway, the question I, I need to be asking is, how is it that the, these late five summonses weren't sent to me by registered post? Why are the Gardaí hand-delivering those to me now to make sure that I'm up in Dublin uh, next week? And it's a very short time frame as well, you know? But I think uh, I mentioned to you earlier as well, Jimmy, we've just recently as well had evidence not only that our emails are being... Uh, are they're being in, intercepted and read before they're being uh, allowed to continue on their journey. That's from the Integrity Ireland um, website, those emails. And I had a, an, ET, an IT guy who did a test, and he said, yes, absolutely. He said, your, your emails are, are compromised. Um, I've been told by two reporters, one from a national newspaper, that my phones are being listened, listened into. And then finally, uh, just last week, now because we had to move house twice because of these threats and other various difficulties that we were experiencing. I used the opportunity when we moved house to um, mask our current location uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so I arranged for post to be forwarded by and post from our previous address to my current address. Now this is all set up officially, it's all been paid for, and as far as I was aware, all the mail that was uh, destined for me uh, at my old address was actually coming to this new address. And then very interestingly, I got a phone call last week from a solicitor in Dublin who does some occasional um, uh, service-related uh, tasks for me, and I paid them a fee for it. They had sent me uh, some documents in the post, which came to me no problem via the old address, but they'd made an error in the invoice and they sent a follow-up letter in one of their standard envelopes, which has the name of their firm on the envelope and the fact that they're solicitors. A very interesting uh, coincidence, that letter was returned to them with one of the post office pink strips on it stating, gone away, moved away. In other words, my service that I've paid for 
to forward mail to me on that particular instance did not work. And the big question is, why not? So, of course, I'm documenting all of this and making sure that I've got this evidence to take in with me when we go into the courts, because in the event that the authorities claim that they forwarded me or sent me or posted me um, summonses, uh, which would make me in default then, you see, because I should, of course, have turned up at the hearing. Uh, but, of course, I had no knowledge whatsoever of the hearing. But, uh, as I said before, when you're up against this level of trickery and deception, um, it's, it's just very, very difficult to know how to deal with it. But um, I will be bringing these uh, envelopes and the, uh, you know, with the, with the postage uh, returned and, and turned away and all that sort of stuff in with me to just to demonstrate that, at the very best, this system of delivering summonses to people is uh, unreliable and possibly uh, is, has been compromised by agents of the state who are engaging in what is, in effect, the criminal interference in, in mail and correspondence. All to you guys. Well, thanks, uh, Stephen. It, it, it has, it's always suggested here on site that like, when it comes to registered mail, do not sign for anything, do not accept anything, and if you do need to get registered mail sent to you, make sure that you know who's sending it to you and get them to put a little mark on it so you can be sure that you know where the mail is coming from. So that's just a little bit of a tip that, w that we pick up here on site over the years. So, uh, Sean, do you have anything that you want to want to yeah, add? Yeah, well, I think obviously we've had um, Emma and Amanda Kelly on uh, uh, on the show, so uh, with some uh, sort of uh, stunning sort of uh, discussion of what's going on, and they're, they're up at a demonstration. Uh, I think it was on the seventh of uh, July outside the Dal, um, and. Uh, Basically, I was just wondering, you were saying that you were on, a, on your way to a demonstration to tour. Um, yes. So, uh, basically, could you give us some sort of feedback on, on sort of uh, the 320 people, a bit of a, an overview, if you like, of the 320 cases in front of the Commission at the moment, and uh, uh, just uh, for our audience, just to sort of clarify, you know, the kind of situation that's going on in Ireland at the moment. Yes, uh, well... Um um, a simple overview of these 320 cases that you're talking about, uh, Sean, is that uh, back in, I believe it was November, I think it was 2012 now, um, a group of us went to the Ministry of Justice when Mr. Shatter was the Minister for Justice. And we handed in, there was 40 of us all together, but we handed in 17 dossiers of, of uh, complaints, serious complaints about serious and repeated malfeasance by uh, authority figures uh, in justice-related rules. Now, this would involve um, Garda Síochána, of course, uh, the Irish Police Force. It involved the Garda Síochána Ombudsman Commission, who are supposed to be the oversight body that looks into wrongdoing by guards. It involved uh, various legal, so-called legal professionals. Uh, who are involved in uh, covering up crimes or fraud and perjury and so on and so forth. And finally, of course, it, it, it included some complaints about what things that are going on in the courts, about the misbehaviour of registrars, senior civil servants, judges, and so on and so forth. Now, what most people uh, in Ireland are aware of is that that figure mushroomed over the last few years from um, 17 original complaints that were handed in um, to now over 320, and I wouldn't be surprised if that figure is growing and they're not telling us about it, you know. Um, but after a lot of pressure by independent TDs uh, such as Mick Wallace, uh, Claire Daly, Luke Flanagan, and a few others, uh, and ourselves, of course, with Integrity Ireland, another group called Justice for All, uh, we were putting, uh, working together, putting pressure on the authorities to try and get someone to look into this stuff. Now, the first thing the, the authorities did was what we now consider to be the usual response, which is to try and obfuscate, to delay, to obstruct, to circumvent, to pass the parcel, basically, and, and write us back these inane, pointless, uh, time-wasting letters uh, to try and give everyone involved the impression that, that the matters were being properly dealt with, and of course they weren't. Um, everybody was getting exasperated and frustrated with the lack of uh, feedback. Um, there are some outstanding points that need to be noted. The, eventually, the, minister, the new Minister for Justice set up what she called uh, a, an independent review panel, which is, of course, anything but independent. Um, some of the lawyers actually on this review panel who are getting very handsomely paid for this work, 
are actually the subjects of some of the complaints that we put in. Uh, and that's the level of idiocy that, that we're up against and, and conspiracy and collusion. This is the norm here in Ireland. Um, but anyway, um, the, the, the long and the short of it is that uh, the, the government said that they're going to do this independent review, but they haven't interviewed a single complainant. They haven't confirmed with any of us, despite us writing to them numerous times, whether or not we can see our files so that we know that what they're looking at is complete and, and appropriate and adequate. There's, there's been no engagement whatsoever with uh, the victims uh, of, of, and the, the people who submitted these complaints. So what I'm saying is the whole thing is utterly compromised. Now, I couldn't tell you an exact number uh, regarding how many people from Integrity Ireland, per se, uh, are in that 320, but certainly a substantial number of those 320 complaints came from uh, Integrity Ireland members. Um, some of them submitted them directly to the Minister for Justice, and some of them came through the, the, the aforementioned TDs and so on. But to say that there is no confidence amongst those of us on the ground that there is any intention by the government to properly investigate these matters uh, would be a great, great understatement. And even Mick Wallace, who, who as a TD, you know, as a member of our Irish Parliament, he, uh, he was the one urging caution, saying, look, look, you know, we've given them these complaints, let's wait and find out what it is they're going to do. But even him, finally, you know, he turned around and said, look, this is clearly just a fig leaf. Um, the, the government are doing everything they can to suppress this, to kick the can down the road. We've got a general election coming up, and I would, ha I, I would guess that their intention is to make sure that um, the election is going to come and go without these matters being dealt with, and then they'll just be handed over to another, another bunch of officials in the new government, wherever it is, uh, for them to prevaricate and, uh, and um, delay and forestall, you know. But uh, while we're on the, the very, just very quickly, uh, guys, because I know I, I'm almost out of time here myself, uh, but very quickly, I'd just like to go back to one incident regarding the, uh, the issue of compromised mail, because obviously if we can't rely on the mail service and we can't rely on the, on the post office to, to abide by the law, then we're all in difficulties. Now, one of, the, one of the rules is that if someone sends you a registered letter and you, you're not at home to sign for it, the postman is supposed to drop a little green slip in through the door. And you then have to travel down to the local uh, main post office, wherever that would be, the holding area. And you present ID and you go in and you sign for your registered letter in your name. But you have to you know, show who you are, prove that you are the person that the letter is intended for, and the letter then gets handed over to you. Now, in my own case, uh, dealing with uh, the, these, um, uh, these Collins characters, and I'll only just mention their name there briefly, just for the sake of avoiding confusion, but dealing with these Collins characters, um, when I had to sue one of them, the, the, the partner in the suit was a postman. Now, um, I had to end up reporting to the post office on that there were three occasions where registered letters were held up for as long as eight days in the local post office without them even being registered in the book. And this was to try and uh, stop me serving court papers on this Collins character. Now, in a very interesting twist, his brother, who incidentally is a, is a long-time criminal um, from the UK, but he's now living in Ireland, he took over the so-called defense of his brother's cases on his behalf. I mean, technically, he shouldn't be allowed to do this, but anyway, that's another story. But anyway, he, uh, on one occasion, for example, and I'll just finish up with this little uh, this example of what we're up against. On one, one occasion, he sent a registered letter, or at least he claimed to have sent a registered letter to me. Uh, whatever happened, it was not signed for at my house, and it, therefore it went to the holding area in Castlebar in County Mayo for three days. Now, I can just tell you now, guys, that I never saw that letter. If I never saw any green slip telling me that it was waiting to be collected or whatever. But what I can tell you is that a court hearing went ahead in my absence, and this Collins character from Wexford signed an affidavit saying that I had been served with that registered letter which contained the notice, or allegedly contained a notice that I was supposed to be in court. Now, I was, I was aghast, sorry guys, it's my interference here, I was aghast uh, to, to find out that he had committed perjury once again, because clearly I hadn't signed for any such letter. But I then went to the post office uh, and post, and I asked them, 
had the any record of this particular registered letter. Now I had a form that they sent that, that Collins had sent into the court, and it had the number, the tracking number of this particular letter on it. And according to this form, it said letter sent from Wexford, tried to deliver it in Castle Bar, no one home, and then there it said sign for on a such and such a date. And I thought, well, hold on a minute, I certainly didn't sign for it. So I went in and got the signature. I got a copy of the signature from Ann Post uh, headquarters. And there is the name of a certain, um, I'll just say that he's an ex-Garda sergeant, retired, who is the Commissioner of Oaths and the signatory for lots of uh, the Collins man in Mayo, lots of his, his stuff. And I hope this doesn't sound too complicated. But basically, what had happened is, someone else had gone to the post office and picked up the registered letter that was addressed to me and signed for it in their own name. And then the documents were presented to the court as evidence that I had collected that letter. Now, that, that's open and shot criminal activity being conducted. That's and when I, you know, and I told the courts about it, I, and then I registered a criminal complaint with the Garda Shia Corner, and to the best of my knowledge, absolutely nothing whatsoever has been done about it. And of course, the, the hearing, the court hearing and the decisions made in the court, meanwhile, stand, because I didn't turn up to the, to the hearing. I didn't know what was going on. Do you understand? That's terrible. So this is, this is the level of corruption and collusion that we're up against here, guys. And uh, I hope that the listeners around the world are picking up on this, because to all intents and purposes, Ireland presents itself to the world as a quaint little country, you know, we're, we're, we're a modern democracy and a modern, a modern democratic republic, however we want to call ourselves, so to speak. And, you know, we, we have all the normal rules and regulations, the same as all the other developed countries around the world. But the truth of the matter is that there is a cabal, um, a sort of a mafia, if you like, of um, authority figures in, well, in high, high positions of authority and power and influence who are positioning all their own friends and cronies in similar places. And on the outside, we look as if we're following all the normal rules of democracy. But actually, underneath, it is this uh, cabal of connected, corrupted uh, individuals um, milking the system hand over fist at the great expense of the Irish public. I hope that'll do us for, for today, guys. Well, that's some stunning testimony. Yeah. yeah. That's some stunning yeah, testimony, thank Stephen. Thank you. Well, uh, my, my pleasure, Sean, and uh, I hope to talk to you both again, Jimmy and Sean. Well, well good yeah. luck uh, next Wednesday. Uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch anyway, and uh, it's next Wednesday you're in Dublin, is it? That's right, Jimmy, Okay, yeah. well, uh, good luck on Wednesday, and I uh, hope it all goes well for you, and uh, stay in touch. I, I will, of course, Jimmy, and thanks again, Sean. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for t coming on. It's uh, been uh, an amazing uh, sort of uh, testimony you've said there. It's uh, fantastic. All right, Sean. Bye, bye, folks. Bye, bye. So there we go. That was a pre-record from yesterday evening, and um, we were busy. Uh, we were busy putting the show. To Sean, have you got a speaker on there? Don't break your neck, Sean. You're all right. <laughs> One, two. Okay, is that echo stop now? I. No, not quite, but I can still hear myself. The microphone's going to take a second to calm down. Right. No, it's still there. But um, yeah, it's it's very strong, Sean. Can 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 you maybe uh, mute your mic? I'll try. So if uh, Sean has his mic muted, I, I have to say, like we're down to our, our last. Two, we haven't even got four minutes left, but this has been an amazing Sunday of testimony and information coming from all various sources, from the uh, f from nuclear to prison activists to uh, deaths and murders which have not been investigated to tampering with mail and it's just astounding sean do you want do you want to jump in here uh while we have a few minutes left yeah i'll give it a go uh it, yeah it has been amazing uh and then at the last minute we get uh chris busby on and you know what's happening with him uh being you know outrightly attacked in my opinion 
um, by the uh, the powers that be. And this happened to me in the UK, and it's uh, it's happened to the Guardian newspaper and Glenn Greenwald and many others. Um, it's about time people started waking up in the UK. I hope they will, um, and uh, start supporting activists as much as possible because we're a we're a shrinking crowd. Well, indeed, and uh, not just supporting activists, but getting familiar with some of the terms which have been bandied at us, especially legal terms, and um, and there's a lot to be said for what Pat V, Pat Veldon, our own Pat Veldon says here on Monday evenings at 9 p.m. And uh, legality is a different matter to what is lawful. So I think we need to come to terms with our own sovereignty. I think we need to come to terms with how much power we really have. And uh, and while we're doing that, come together with other people uh, of, of similar and like-minded thought. Yeah, well, I'll certainly agree with that. We have that hope uh, here in Ireland. And uh, we, we, we can see that happening in Greece and Spain and uh, Italy, uh, the beginnings of a sort of a left wing sort of uh, socialist, you know, sort of uh, social aware party. Uh, we need a bit more of that. We, we really can't take any more of this uh, corporate uh, uh, sort of uh, dictatorship that yeah. we seem to have found ourselves in at the, yeah, the present well, moment. But, uh, but Sean, though, Sean, 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 at the end of the day, though, is this Greek thing not just uh, a dog and pony show just to distract the populace and keep them busy um, while there's something else more important going on somewhere else, perhaps? Well, certainly you come to us for the news, and we've certainly told you a lot of things that aren't in the news and uh, uh, that are in the back of the, in the background. And uh, I hope that you appreciate uh, the findings we found. Well, indeed, like you know, um, I can't believe how much effort has gone in now to putting this show together. I'm really glad we did put the effort in. Like it started last night, and uh, all my all my lovely notes for this week. Uh, have been ceremoniously uh, thrown out of the cockpit and they're now floating now down to the sea. <laughs> well, well, maybe we'll get to them next week, some of the more important ones. Well, perhaps, perhaps, but it doesn't matter, like, you know, like, news is always moving, so, like, we we won't worry too much about it because I think the info that came to us today, now, the testimony today has just been astounding. It has, it has. So, and listen, then finally, uh, uh, just a quick heads up, I think, to Z. The uh, the uh, uh, the busker, and he's out there somewhere. And I hope you search the internet for the rest of his music because he does some great stuff. Say it is